Good morning and welcome to Year Four's English lesson on this Wednesday morning. Uh, we're going to start this morning with um, a couple of chapters of Varjak Paul. Uh, we're going to look at page, uh, chapters sorry, 18 and 19. Um, you'll find chapter 18 um, on page 130 of the yearbook. Uh, the ebook, sorry, not the yearbook, um, and that can be found on Microsoft Teams or on the school website. Uh, press pause while you're finding it and press play when you're ready to listen and follow. Press pause now. Chapter 18. I'm starving, grumbled Tam late the next night back in their alleys. The three of them sat on a high brick wall together thinking about food. My belly shrinking. I can feel it. Me too, said Varjak. That mouse was good, but it was only a mouse. You're right, said Holly. This is getting serious. It's time for drastic action, and I've got a plan. She looked Varjak up and down. First of all, though, you've got to look normal. Tell me, Mr. Paul, are you ever planning to clean yourself? Varjak shook his head. He was outside. He didn't have to wash. At home, Mother was always washing me. I hated it. But you're not at home now. Here she goes, sighed Tam. I don't have to do anything I don't like, said Varjak. You can do what you want, agreed Holly. But look at you. The people will notice. They'll think you're wild and they'll take you away. Varjak inspected his coat. She was right. He was filthy. The, flying, the fine silver blue fur was completely caked with grime. I like it, he said, rather pleased with himself. Plus, she added, you stink. He didn't respond. I'm sorry, but you really do. Varjak looked to Tam, but even she was silent this time. OK, OK, he grumbled, reluctantly licking his paws. You sound just like mother sometimes. He stopped after a few licks. Is that better? Holly looked him calmly in the eye. I'm not saying this to annoy you. I'm saying it because it's dangerous to look so dirty. You'll draw attention to us all and you'll ruin my plan. Now do it properly or I'm off. Varjak snorted but resumed his cleaning. If you're a blue whatever it is, you should be proud of how you look, she coaxed. We are the noblest of cats, he muttered through a mouthful of mud. But the old boast rang hollow in the city. Would any of his family rescue a stranger? The elder poor, perhaps, not the rest. So who was more noble, the blue or this spiky street cat who'd saved his life? The question bothered him. It turned everything he believed on its head. So he pushed it out of his mind and concentrated on his cleaning. All right, said Holly at last. That'll do. Varjak's fur was a dull grey colour. It looked very ordinary. It didn't look like the, blue, the coat of a Mesopotamian blue anymore. And he liked it that way. Now the collar, she said. You can't be a street cat with a collar. Come here. This was more like it. He's always hated that thing round his neck. Holly gnawed at the collar. He was vulnerable, balanced on top of a wall with her sharp teeth just a bite away from his throat. But he trusted Holly. She'd rescued him. She was his friend. There, she moved back. Varjak wiggled his shoulders and the hated collar fluttered down. It fell through the bars of a a metal grill and disappeared into the sewers beneath the city. Now he was just another street cat with no ties, no family and no home. Good, said Holly. You're one of us. If we run into them, that's what you say. Run into who, said Varjak, though he knew the answer already. He grinned. Not that big, bad Sal. Please, cried Tam. You don't know what you're saying. This isn't a joke said Holly. She sounded serious. Varjak stopped grinning. We have to pass near her territory to get where we're going. Remember what Ginger did to you? These cats are worse, much worse. They set off silently, each in their own thoughts. Holly led them through the back streets, always taking the ways that were quiet and hidden. But the light and noise grew stronger the further they went. The rumbling of the city was louder, harsher, Soon they couldn't avoid the dirty orange glare of streetlights. They were in the open now, coming up to a crossroads. Holly's fur prickled up fast. Hide, she hissed. They pressed themselves back into the alley, 
just in time to see a column of cats patrolling the other side of the crossroads. Varjak's insides knotted as he saw them, and his cheek burned where Ginger had slashed him. Holly was right. They looked much worse than the cat who'd nearly killed him. There were seven of them. They swaggered and strutted on the sidewalk as if they owned the whole world. Other cats got out of their way, scurrying aside as they approached. At the head of the column was a brawny tom with stripy fur. Varjak caught a glimpse of his face. It was covered in scars. That's Razor, whispered Tam. One of her lieutenants. The three of them crouched silently in their hiding place, watching, waiting until the patrol had passed. OK, said Holly at last. It's clear now. Let's move before they come back. This crossroads is the boundary, Tam told Varjak as they left the safety of the alley. Don't ever cross it. I won't, he said. There were no shadowy alleys where Holly took them. Instead, there were tall white buildings arranged in a square. In its centre was a water fountain and a huge stone column pointing up at the sky. Around the column's base, there were four statues, each at a corner. There were statues, they were statues of lions made of gleaming bronze. They were giants. Each paw was the size of a man. They had shaggy wild manes around their heads, proud, free, fearless faces. They were so powerful, so magnificent, so sure of themselves. That's what we should be, whispered Tam. What we could be, said Varjak. They're great. They sat there for a while, just looking at the statues. We can only come here late at night, said Holly. During the day, it's too crowded. People, cars, dogs. But at least it's neutral ground. The gangs leave it alone, which means they also have those also leave those birds alone. Varjak looked again. He was so thrilled by the statues, he'd hardly noticed the square was swarming with pigeons. Dozens of them strutted about beneath the moonlight, and more were coming in all the time. The air pulsed with their, tri their trilling and cooing. So tell me, Mr. Paul, how exactly would you hunt one? What do you mean, said Varjak, suddenly suspicious. Was she making fun of him again? He'd never tried to hunt a bird. It seemed too difficult. I mean, go and get one of those pigeons. It sounded like a challenge. He searched her mustard eyes. She didn't look like she was making fun of him. She meant it. All right, he said. I will. Holly, said Tam. That's not fair. Don't take any notice of her, Varjak. She's being mean again. I want to do it, he said, still looking into Holly's eyes. She smiled. Varjak slunk into the square. He selected a bird and turned all his awareness onto it. He observed it with his eyes, ears, whiskers. Nothing it did could surprise him now. He and it were one. He crept towards the pigeon, stealthy as Jalal himself. In the whole world, there was nothing but him and his prey. Varjak sprang, and a hundred wings came at him. A hundred claws curved out. A hundred beaks cawed in chaos. Panic, Varjak fled from the flock. He hadn't expected anything so fierce. His fur ruffled and his tail trembled. He hid behind Holly and Tam and watched the birds settle down a safe distance. Varjak, cried Tam, are you okay? He shook his head. I told you, Holly, no one could do that. Exactly, said Holly. That's exactly what happens to me every time. That's why even the gangs don't bother with this place. But I always think, if we could just work out how to catch the birds, we'd never go hungry again. It's impossible, panted Varjak. His pulse was still pounding. Impossible! For one cat, yes, said Holly. And yes, we usually hunt alone. But imagine three of us hunting together. It could just work. Well, that's the plan. What do you think? Yes, said Varjak Paul. I don't like the sound of this, said Tam. She buried her head in her paws and curled up to sleep. Wake me up when it's time to go home. Chapter 19. Varjak and Holly talked through the night by the giant bronze lions. There was nothing to distract them but the fountains trickle and the birds trilling. It was strange at first. No one else had even wanted to talk about hunting before. 
Bardak could still barely believe that someone his own age was interested in it, and not senseless kitten games like Jay, Jethro and Jerome. But it was true. Holly was easy to talk to because she was like him. She liked the same things. Her mind worked in the same way. Sometimes it was hard to keep up with her. Whenever he thought he had the, the answer to something, she asked another difficult question. Why like, like this, not like that? And she had ideas he would never have thought up. But he had a few of his own too, and together they worked out their plan. That night, Varjak felt something he'd never felt before, or rather, he didn't feel something. He didn't feel alone anymore. They woke Tam just before dawn and explained the plan to her. Her eyes grew round with fear. Me? She said. You want me to do that? Why me? Can you do my part of the plan, said Holly, or Varjak's? Well, no, but you've got to do it, Tam, said Varjak. It's impossible without you. It is, she said. Of course it is, said Holly. And if you do it, I promise I won't say her name any more. Well then, said Tam cheerfully, what are we waiting for? They took up their positions as the first rays of sunshine splashed onto the white buildings, filling the square with light. Everything began to glow, the ground, the sky, even the water in the fountain. Barjak crept up on the pigeons from one corner of the square. Holly crept up from another. Tam stood in front of them on the far side of the flock. At Holly's signal, Tam sprang at the pigeons. A hundred birds beat their wings, fierce and dangerous in their flock. Tam kept going, never slowing, just aiming for the other side in a blur of speed they couldn't stop. And Varjak and Holly flew out of the morning sun behind them. It should have been easy. The birds were distracted by Tam and didn't see them coming in the haze of brilliant light. That was the plan. But even as Varjak dived in, the thrill of the hunt in his veins, it started to go wrong. Tam was clear through, but there were still too many pigeons in a, a mass. He and Holly were on the edge of the flock, but couldn't get close enough to any single bird to strike. The birds turned on Holly, wings flapping savagely, elbows sorry, claws curving out. She didn't run. She stood there bravely, trying hard, but now they were surrounding her, pecking at her with shrill, sharp beaks. Holly was in trouble. She was trapped and couldn't get out. They were tearing, scratching, ripping at her. Barjak could see the panic mounting in her face. Tam was helpless on the other side. Quick, he had to do something. Slow time, the fourth skill. Everything will seem to slow down around you, but you will be fast. You will be faster than anything. But would it work in the real world? He breathed in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, and the wings slowed down. Barjak could see each beat, each claw, as if in slow motion. He dived after Holly into the mass of birds, moving smoothly through the chaos, making them fly apart for just a moment. Holly, he called. She looked up. It was enough to break the rising terror in her eyes. She darted through the gap he'd made, away from the flock and towards Tam to safety. Out of danger now, Varjak breathed normally and switched out of slow time. It worked. The fourth skill really worked. Did they hurt you? He panted as he caught up with her. Nothing wrong with me, said Holly, though she was trembling. Thanks for getting me out, she added, much more quietly. No problem. He saved you, Holly, bubbled Tam. I guess we're even now, she muttered. I didn't do it for that, said Varjak. Holly didn't meet his eyes, but just for a second, Varjak thought he saw a smile flicker on her face. Come on, she said, sidling away from the square. We've got to hurry. I don't want to be here in broad daylight. It's too dangerous. You don't want another go, said Varjak. He knew she was shaken. Her fur was still ruffled, but maybe it would help to try again. Why bother, she said, padding back through the city. The plan didn't work. It was a stupid idea. No, it wasn't, said Varjak, keeping pace with her, ahead of Tam. 
and you did everything you could. How about me, said Tam? Did I do all right, Varjak? You were great. You were both really brave. I was great, beamed Tam. There was just too many of them this time, said Varjak, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Maybe, said Holly, picking up the pace. Maybe if we tried it another way. They started on a new plan as they headed back. The city was beginning to rumble with life once more. Familiar streets flashed by as they went, uh, flashed past as they went by. I'm still hungry, said Tam, and nostrils twitched. Wait, you two, it's that fishy smell again. She stopped by a, a turning off a side street, the same turning where Varjak had caught the mouse. Even in daylight, it curved away into darkness, into shadow. Come on, Tam, said Holly over her shoulder. But it's that lovely smell again, said Tam. And there wasn't any food in the park and the hunting didn't work. And I'm still hungry. We're not stopping here, said Holly. If you go, you're on your own. She turned back to Varjak and carried on walking. They walked away, planning their next hunt together. Tam stayed behind at the turning. It's your last call, Tam. I'll see you back in our alleys. Okay, that's the end of chapter 19. Um, we'll move on with our learning now. Um, first of all, just ask a few questions to yourselves here. If you're in school, you might want to ask in pairs. Um, at home, you might want to just think to yourself and maybe talk with an adult. So what do you think of the vanishings? Um, we've talked about them already in the story. They weren't in the chapters we've just read, but we have spent, we've been starting to learn about them. And what do you think is happening to the cats? Where do you think they're going? And what makes you think that? Press pause while you're just having a little think about it and press play when we come back together. Okay, so we're writing this morning. We're starting to write quotations. Um, how to write quotes from eyewitnesses, people that might have been in the situation. And we're linking it to Varjak Paul. First of all, though, can you remember the features of a newspaper front page? Um, discuss with a partner if you're in school or an adult if you're at home. Just have a think, what are the features, main features of a newspaper front page? Okay, welcome back. So if we think back to Iron Man, do you remember the news article that we wrote together? Um, the main features in the newspaper front page were, um, you must have the name of the newspaper, you must have the date, you really want the headline of the story, and you will need the journalist and the author um, who has written the story. Um, you normally could have a picture with a caption. Um, you would need to have an introduction or an orientation. Um, you'd always have the main story, which includes quotes, people that were there. And finally, you would end up with a conclusion, a reorientation that brings the story up to date. So have a look at the following waggle of a newspaper front page. Can you find as many of the features as you possibly can? Um, we talked about a few of them on the previous slide. Just press pause while you're having a look and press play as I um, bring it back together in a couple of minutes time. Okay, so I've color coded all the different features of the newspaper front page. Um, you can see in green here, we've got the name of the newspaper. The headline, The Vanishings, is there. That's the title of the story. Um, the person that wrote it is the journalist. That's in orange here. Now we've got our orientation and we'll be um, writing an orientation and opening tomorrow in tomorrow's English lesson. Um, the main story is in blue here, um, but there are some quotations and I've put the quotes from the different characters from our story in purple. So you can see they're drip fed through the main story. They're in there, there and there. Um, we have a reorientation to finish the, the conclusion and then we'd have the purple, the picture with a caption. So our independent task today is that I want you to imagine that you are either Varjak, Tam or Holly. And how, if you were them, how might you answer the following questions if you were them? Um, you must, don't forget to say why, why you think, um, and why you think um, about, you know, what you think about the vanishings and why you think that. Um, and you've got four questions down here in red. So the questions are, how do you feel about the vanishings? Have you seen anything suspicious on the streets? Do you know anyone who has vanished? And do you feel safe 
in the city. So they could be your four questions that you're going to use this morning. And I want you to think about what the answers might be to each of those questions. Press pause while you're thinking about those questions and press play when you're ready to move on. OK, so if we're remembering that our focus today is writing a quotation, writing something that somebody has said, OK? Um, the question here was then, how did you feel when you found out about the vanishings? And what I'm going to do is get Holly to answer that question. So she'll say, I felt petrified when um, Holly told me about the vanishings. I don't want it to happen to me, exclaimed Varjak Paul, age one from the Contessa's house. So you've got there, um, the bit that Varjak says is in speech marks. The bit that Varjak says is in speech marks there. You must have the punctuation at the end. And then finally, you would say who it is that says it. Okay, we're trying to avoid the word said, trying to use the word uh, like exclaimed, whispered, shouted, words instead of said. And then you would have, you might have the age of the character and then where they've come from. Okay, so from the Contessa's house. That's an important structure to use during this lesson this morning. Okay, so what I want you to have a go at this morning is actually having a go at writing some quotes from Varjak, Holly and Tam. Um, and your success criteria, you know, when you're writing the quote, state the name of the eyewitness, you know, say who they are um, and where they're from. Um, use powerful adjectives if you can. Um, he witnessed the entire horrific ordeal. Make it quite descriptive. Um, use um, different words to introduce the direct speech, okay? Like we said just now, different synonyms for said, quoted, stated, declared, whispered, shouted. Um, and then finally, make sure you're using inverted commas and punctuation correctly to show direct speech. You can have a look, refer back to the waggle. You'll see inside the in our waggle today, there, is, there are some quotes there. Um, and I want you to lay them out a bit like that, if you possibly can. OK, so have a little go at trying to answer the questions, pretending that you're Varjak, Holly or Tam. You don't need to do too many. Um, three of them would be perfectly OK. Um, if you're going to do them and structure them properly, that would be all you needed to do today. OK, so press pause while you're writing and press play when you're ready to come back for the plenary. OK, so in our plenary this morning, please have a look at your quotations. Have you used everything on your success criteria from the previous slide? And if you haven't, how could you improve the quotes? Remember, look at the waggle. It's there for you to use. Structure your quotes based on this, the same way the waggle is. OK, it will really help. OK, right. Take care of yourselves and I will see you for tomorrow's lesson. Thank you then.